Um, this is an interview for the Purdue University's Oral History Program. Today's date is August 31st, 2012. I am here in the Purdue studios in West Lafayette with two married members of Purdue's class of 1970, um, Colonel Jerry Ross and Karen Ross. Uh, my name is Tracy Grimm and I'm with the University Archives. Thank you both for being here and taking the time in your busy schedules to participate in our oral history program. We really appreciate it. We're pleased to be here, Tracy. Um, as we usually start our interviews, I'd like to ask you both to state your full names and date of birth for our catalogers. Okay. My name is Jerry Lynn Ross, born on the 20th of January in 1948. Thank you. And I'm Karen Sue Pearson Ross, and I was born April 23rd, 1948. Great. Thank you. And I know you're both Indiana natives, so um, one of my first questions and is what was it like growing up in Indiana and how would you each describe your childhoods? Do you want to go to that first? Uh, I grew up in Northwest Indiana. My hometown was Crown Point, Indiana. Uh, it's the county seat of Lake County, the northwestern most county in the state. But I still lived five miles outside of town, so I was a country kid. Uh, I enjoyed my childhood immensely. I grew up in a great time in our country, and uh, I enjoyed uh, the freedom that my parents gave me, the encouragement and support that they gave me, and uh, the, a very good educational system that we had in the Crown Point school system. I had great friends, great memories of the time. Uh, I played a lot of uh, baseball and football and, and sandlot of, of all sorts uh, as a kid. I worked on farms when I got a little bit older to make money to put into the bank for my Purdue education. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up at a very exciting time in our country because it was just as the space race was starting to begin. In fact, I was making scrapbooks about uh, flying in space and satellites before the first satellites were launched. So that's 1957 was the first, launch, the first one to launch, mm -hmm. yeah. So I was in the fourth grade when uh, the Russians launched the first Sputnik in October of 1957. And then the U.S. responded with the launch of Explorer 1 on January 31st, 1958. Mm -hmm. And since I had made those scrapbooks and had read the articles that I put into those scrapbooks, and the fact that many of those articles were written about Purdue graduates from the state of Indiana who were involved in the very earliest parts of our space program, I decided in the fourth grade after those two satellites had been launched that I was going to go to Purdue University, that I was going to become an engineer, and I was going to become involved, if, if I could at all, in our country's space program. That's great. Uh, I grew up uh, in a, a small uh, farm outside of Sheridan, Indiana. And um, my uh, dad was somebody that uh, sheared sheep. And we had a small farm, so we had lots of different animals. We had uh, chickens, and we had guineas, and we had um, uh, uh, sheep, and we always had uh, hogs, and we had some dairy cattle for a little while, and then we always kept a couple of beef cattle. And every winter, my dad would butcher. He'd always butcher some hogs, so we had pork, fresh pork in the freezer, and always butcher some beef, so we had beef in the freezer. And after I left home, he started butchering a, a sheep, too. So we had a lamb all the time, and some people around had lamb. And my parents had a, a garden, always had a really big garden in the, in the, uh, during the summer. And we'd always have, enjoy the nice fresh things out of the garden. When I got to be 10 years old, uh, I got to start in 4-H, and that was a really exciting time. So that was in 1958. Same time Jerry was watching Sputnik, I was excited about getting to be a 4 h -er for the first time. And you were in 4-H, too. I was also in 4-H. A little bit after Karen started, and while Karen, I think, was in 10 years of 4-H, mm -hmm. I, I completed four years of 4-H. My sports and my uh, work outside of the house on the farms kept me somewhat limited in that aspect. 4-H yeah. uh, was something that we enjoyed as a whole family. I was the, um, the first of three daughters, and but still, since we had three daughters, I got to be in boys 4-H. All three of us got to be in boys 4-H, so we got to do both boys and girls things. And so the first year I took foods, but then the, after that we went into sewing. My mother was a really good seamstress. She sewed a lot of our clothes. And uh, she also sewed blankets for the sheep when we were, we were taking the sheep to, to fairs. She could go out and look at a sheep and make a pattern for it and come in and make a blanket for the sheep to, to, have, uh, to keep it clean and everything. We're getting ready for fairs. 
we showed at the county fair and we showed at some uh, gold medal shows at other county fairs and we also look forward to the state fair every year. Indiana State Fair was like the highlight of our year, I think. We showed both uh, sheep and uh, hogs and uh, we look forward to the dress review at our county fair. Um, we had sewing, garden, flowers, um, hogs, sheep, um, maybe some crafts uh, at the 4-H fair and we look forward to those four or five days. Uh, I loved growing up in the country, uh, being a 4-H farm family. Um, being, being in Indiana, I thought it was the best way to grow up. She loved it so much that when she found out that I was going to be an engineer, she wasn't sure she wanted to marry me because <laughs> she wanted to marry a farmer mm -hmm. and stay in Indiana. <laughs> well, I, I grew up around kids that were in agriculture, mm -hmm. and a lot, of the, a lot of the people I knew that were going to Purdue, they were either going to major in agriculture, or if you're a girl, you're going to major in 4-H, I mean, not 4-H, in uh, home economics, mm -hmm. something related to that, or being a teacher, being in education, mm -hmm. and uh, that was kind of a kind of life I really enjoyed mm -hmm. growing up. I was going to ask you what you two, what you realized you both had in common, because I remember reading your book that, you know, sh you weren't so yes. sure about this engineer. Uh -huh. Not at all. You, you know, no, that's right. For, we were, um, got to know each other uh, our sophomore year and uh, real, really realized that we, we liked each other, wanted to, wanted to see where this is going. But then he came to the Indiana State Fair that year, and I was enjoying the State Fair like normal and loving it and realized that he really wasn't wasn't part of that hadn't been to the state fair before and that kind of gave me second pause but <laughs> then we came back to Purdue and had a really good time and picked up where we left off well I've been to county fairs up in Lake County but Lake County is a long ways from Indianapolis and back then you didn't travel halfway across the state to go to a state fair so I'd never been to a state fair before but uh -huh. but we had a lot of similarities in our families our religious yeah. backgrounds uh, uh, we really grew up very similar uh, in terms of being from mm -hmm. the country and a lot of our values and, mm -hmm. and how we saw things and how we thought we wanted to live our lives. Mm -hmm. One of the big differences was that my dad was a farmer and he sheared sheep for people in five counties and Jerry's dad worked, did work in the U.S. Steel Mill. But they were both, had both grown up with um, uh, farm families and lived, lived out in the country. And both were very hard workers. Uh, our moms are both just absolutely great, love their families, and were stay-at-home moms and, um, you know, put their family first. And we both went to, went to church and uh, thought school was important. Our families told us that school was important, and that's, that's something we shared and thought that education was, was important for us. And we wanted to kind of, we liked, I think we also uh, had in common that we had, um, some ambitions, ambitions to see what we could do, and uh, ambitions to see, you know, see more um, mm -hmm. and do more. Mm -hmm. So we did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so we did. And in, in the, the last few days when spending time with you, I've noticed that you're both really passionate about children and talking with children. Um, can you say a little bit about that, about how, um, how you see your role and what you, what you express to the students when you go visit um, yeah. the schools? Well, for over 30 years as an astronaut, I've gone out to speak to the public and talk to them about the space program. And I've always tried to focus on visiting schools and talking to the children in the schools about the fact that they are each a very unique person, that they have a certain set of God-given talents and likes and dislikes, and that makes them very special, and it makes them special for a certain type of job or career path. And if they can figure out what those special likes and dislikes are and work with their parents and their teachers to determine how they could best apply those unique capabilities, unique qualities to a career and then set some goals for themselves and then study hard and work hard towards those goals. And don't give up too easily if it doesn't happen the first time around. I've, I've, I've done that because I've seen uh, other people who didn't have the, the spark that I did. I knew what I wanted to do from the fourth grade on, and I dedicated everything I did, the studying that I did in school and the money I made uh, to pay for my education, that was all for a purpose and very directed, and I didn't give up. And even though I had some, uh, some blocks, some, some setbacks in my career goals, I never gave up too easily. I always continued to try to pers pursue those ultimate goals. And, and I felt very fortunate that I was able to achieve my ultimate goal of getting into the space program, and not only that, but actually becoming an astronaut 
and getting a chance to go fly on those rockets. And, and I felt blessed because I felt like I was doing exactly what God had intended me to do, to use my talents and skills, to hone those and to use them in such a unique way to serve our country. And I, and I feel that a lot of people are frustrated with their lives because they didn't have somebody to help them understand that or they didn't, didn't see that spark or it was too late. They figured out what they should have done after they were through their, their 12 years of high, sc high school and elementary school and then they thought maybe it was just too late to reverse gears or to try to catch up and, and pursue those goals and, and careers. So I always felt that if you can get the young people, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders, to get excited about what they would like to do when they become adults, then you can maybe make a difference. And, and I've had feedback when I've gone back to my hometown. After each of my flights, I've given a presentation on what I did on that particular mission. And, and after I'd done that several times, I started having some people who had been in my, at some of my earlier talks or their parents would come up to me afterwards and tell me, you know, I, you know, I heard you when I was in fourth grade and now I'm finishing my doctorate or I'm, mm -hmm. I'm finishing my residency as a medical doctor and, you know, I set goals and pursued them and thank you, you know. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine what teachers must feel when they get that kind of feedback from some of their previous students. I always loved school. I had two aunts who were first and second grade teachers. And I got to help them. You got to be at their house when they're getting ready for school. I mean, when I was just little, I got to do that. And when I went to school, I just absolutely loved it. So teaching was something that I wanted, wanted to do. So I've been interested in teaching, being in the classroom, uh, the excitement of learning something new, you know, for forever. That's what I wanted to do. The only trouble I had when I got to high school was deciding what I wanted to teach. I love English, I loved writing, I loved reading, so I thought I'd pursue that. And then at that time, uh, just like it is now, math and science was something that uh, they didn't have enough math and science teachers. And so I thought I'd do math and science. And then I uh, knew that I wanted to uh, um, grow up, be a wife and a mother, possibly right on an Indiana a farm. Farmer's right, life. exactly. <laughs> and there. still there, still there. And so I wanted to do with something that was appropriate for that. And uh, Purdue does did have such a good vocational home economics education program, which is geared not to just general home economics, but to people that wanted to learn something that would be able to turn into a vocation, uh, into a profession possibly. So that met my, it was a little bit more than general home economics, it had like a scientific background, so I enjoyed that, had some math involved, uh, be able to take it back and possibly be a home ec teacher or even work in the county extension office, and so that's the route that I decided to go. And um, I did later on, after we finally settled down in Houston, I taught home economics for five years and um, enjoyed that, and then I found out as I worked with adults and moved into a, a a job in the space program found out that even when you're working with adults, if you're managing them, it's still a teaching process. So I've enjoyed take, you know, working with people, whether they're little kids or my own children or people in 4-H. I was a 4-H leader for a while, and seeing what they know and trying to excite them with something that they don't know and introduce it to them, take them from where they are to knowing just a little bit more. And I, I like that. Um, and then okay, I'm rolling. Um, that's a, a, a good segue into the que next question I was going to ask you both. And, and could you tell us what both of your degrees are in from Purdue? Well, my degree is a Bachelor of Science in uh, Vocational Home Economics Education. And I walked out of here with two degrees, a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering as well as a Master of Science in Mechanical Engineering. What do you, um, what would you say um, your education from Purdue, how, how did it prepare you best for what you ended up, you know, your careers ended up being? Um, what, what are the most important lessons you think you graduated with? I think the most important lesson for me was I didn't know everything, but I was taught the way to find out mm -hmm. the answers and how to attack an engineering problem, to bound it, to find a solution, and to optimize that solution. Uh, when, I, when I went on to active duty in the Air Force, I showed up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base over by Dayton, Ohio, and went to work in the propulsion laboratory in the Ramjet Engine Division. And I was very pleased to be welcomed with opening arms, open arms. Um, there, they had had previous employees there who had Purdue degrees. 
and they thought that they had been some of their very best producers, uh, very best workers. And so I found that my Purdue degree opened doors for me, gave me maybe additional opportunities uh, to get maybe better jobs and to be challenged more with the jobs I was given. But at the same time, there was also another side to that coin, which was the expectation that I was going to produce because of the experience they had had with other Purdue engineers prior to my arriving there. I really like the background to be able to get see a little bit more of the scientific um, aspects of clothing and textiles. I learned to sew, but then I got to learn about fabrics and got to learn to tailor and then went into food preparation and got the scientific reason why things go together the way they do and the purposes. Felt a little bit more like a chemist in the kitchen and understood how, how that can be really fun and, just, and when I was cooking. And I, it, it really prepared me for um, ability to think that I could do things, could do things more, had a, had a uh, educational background to tackle some of the, the jobs or that I had later on, uh, prepared me perfectly for being a, a wife and mother. I remember when I went, was at, living at um, Fairborn, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, being a little bit disappointed at that time that I hadn't gone and done something professional. And I don't know how, but I, th I think, it, I know it got back, I think it was through my mother, got back to our, um, our uh, extension agent back in Hamilton County, Henrietta Rohde, that I was feeling a little bit that way, and she sent me the message that you know I was doing exactly what she hoped that everybody would do, and that would be a, have a raise a family, and uh, you know teach people to have a really good home family life. So that made me feel really good about that part of our life. Then I got to um, um, Fairborn, I mean Friendswood, in Texas, and I um, taught there for a year. And then I did substitute teaching for a while, let me do that, help while I was raising my family. Then I taught for uh, four years at Friendswood High, I'm um, Friendswood uh, Junior High and also at Pearland Intermediate School. And so that prepared me for the, those uh, professional, professional uh, positions. And then I had the opportunity to possibly transfer all of that into working in a space program. And I hadn't known that I was preparing for that, but I got to work in the space program with the food that went on the space shuttle and the space station. And I hadn't worked in that kind of field, hadn't worked as a food technologist, but I found that the preparation that I had fit in perfectly and let me within a few months feel like I was really comfortable in that new position and helped me go from being a, a food technician to a food technologist and later on an industrial engineer and then a manager in, uh, for United Space Alliance. And I was really glad when she moved her chemistry experiments from our kitchen to somewhere <laughs> else. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we did have some of those, right? Uh, oh yeah, well, uh, we're not uh, going into those. <laughs> oh yes, uh, when we were living in married student courts in, uh, in Purdue, I didn't want to Remember, have Remember you brought this up. I do, I <laughs> didn't want to just have the humdrum things, you know, mashed potatoes, and, and uh, we did. At that time, we had a lot of uh, hot dogs and hamburger patties and things like that, but I was wanting to do more cooking, and so we um, had some tapioca pudding. Both of us really enjoyed tapioca pudding, but on the side of the tapioca, and there still is to this day, a recipe for adding juices to tapioca, so you can have fruit-flavored tapiocas. So I followed the recipe very carefully and added uh, orange juice to tapioca, put it in a, in a bowl that we had, and um, had a spoon in it. And later on, you could pick up the spoon and pick up the whole thing of tapioca and take the ball off it and look like half of a half of, like a basket, half of a basketball. basketball. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. And I said, and I said, you've been getting straight A's in home uh -huh, ec. What is this? Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> So I could cook and I could do some things very well, but it also uh, led us into some experiments in the kitchen. Yeah. I was going to ask, what do you remember most about being students at Purdue? I bet that's up there. <laughs> that's up there. <laughs> I, I think one of the things I remember most about Purdue is just the challenge of the academics. Uh, during my undergraduate years, I always felt in, in mechanical engineering like I was running as hard as I could to try to catch up in the next class that I had a big homework assignment or my next test in. And I, I, that's the way I felt the entire four years as mm -hmm. an undergraduate. Very challenging program. Uh, 
I, but I felt like it was I was getting a good education, and that's what I was looking for. Mm -hmm. Once I went into my uh, master's program, I, w I had a half-time research assistantship, which meant that I could only take a limited number of credit hours per semester. And that was a much more moderate pace in ter term of the academics, and I felt much more under control, or I had the situation under control. And I enjoyed the classes much more because I could get ahead, understand more, be looking forward to the next lesson, and to more thoroughly comprehend the concepts and the formulas and, and everything else. So, so that uh, under the, the rigorousness of the undergraduate education mm -hmm. really you know, helped you as you entered yeah. the master's? <laughs> Very much. Uh, the other part of it was I, I was taking Air Force ROTC, and those credit hours didn't count towards my graduation credits. So I had to basically double bookkeep the, the number of credit hours I took in any given semester to, to be able to graduate in a four-year period. It was, I think it was 144 credit hours, semester credit hours to graduate back then. So it was, it was challenging. But at the same time, uh, I, I studied hard. I worked hard. I certainly didn't get straight A's. I tell kids that all the time. But it was the determination to succeed and to, to conquer the, uh, the, the challenges of those classes and to, uh, to work hard to do it. And besides that, then, it was the friendships that we, that we made here. Um, a lot of great friends, and many of them that we still uh, stay in communication with and visit frequently now. And, uh, and then the foundation that gave me to proceed on into my professional career. Mm -hmm. uh, first year, I remember being scared. <laughs> Gone from a, a small uh, country town uh, high school to Purdue was kind of intimidating. Thank goodness through 4 H I'd been here on campus a few times, so it wasn't totally new to me. Um, but you know, just trying to figure out where we fit in, what I was going to do. Um, I think I kind of searched and everything, and then getting involved in activities really helped. Having some friends on campus helped. And during our sophomore year, Jerry and I met, and then he was in Circle Pines Cooperative House, and that gave me an, another another group of friends to, to be involved with. And I really loved, I uh, lived in Meredith Hall the first uh, two years. I really liked the, some of the friends there, um, roommates. And um, my friend Brenda Summers came from uh, Montana. And she had always wanted to go to a school that was going to the Rose Bowl. And she picked Purdue. Purdue had never been to the Rose Bowl. But do you know that year was the year that Bob Greasy was quarterback and we got to go to got to the Rose Bowl for the first time, so that was great. And um, don't know how she figured that out, but, but she did. She needs to come back. To yeah, Purdue. she does. <laughs> she and so sophomore year, she, was, she had planned to come back to Purdue, but she got back to Montana, and she was just too homesick, so she didn't come. So that was the end of Purdue's trips to the Rose Bowl for a while. And um, finding my way and, you know, of course, looking toward the future, trying to figure out what my future was going to be, and then I did like the classes and the teachers very, very much. Um, we just had some really, really good teachers in, in home economics, and I enjoyed the home economics buildings. I love going to the home ec cafeteria. Every once in a while, I'd take a break in the afternoon and go get some of their poppy seed cake that was always really, really good. And, um, and she had time to take a break once yes, in a while. Yes, I did have time to take some break once in a while. And I, I love the football games, love going to the basketball games just being part of the student body, and all the excitement was, was contagious at Purdue. Yeah. That, was, like that was another neat aspect while we were here. We really did have some very good uh, athletics while we were here. Mm -hmm. Bob Greasy took us to the Rose Bowl, and he was followed by Mike Phipps, who did a great job beating Notre Dame three years in a row. And <laughs> I knew I was going to get you a treat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, Rick Mount and Herm Gilliam and, and some other outstanding basketball players during the period we were here. So we had some very good sports teams while, we, while we're here at, at Purdue. Mm -hmm. So you worked hard, but then there was... Uh -huh. uh, Got to have some fun sometimes. Some yeah, fun. Had, had lots of fun, made lots of friends. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, uh, is there anything else you'd want to say about Purdue and your experience here? Um, I was going to ask you about the Tomahawk, where you, you met, and, and how that... Say a little bit about that, and then we uh, we'll moved to NASA. Mm -hmm. We were both involved in activities during high school. Jerry more in sports, and me more in 4-H and things going on at, at high school. And we both wanted to be involved in activities in college when we could fit it in. Um, I became active in student government services. I was on the sophomore board of student of, of, of the um, student government services, 
and jury years was sophomore a class council. Oh, so, okay, mm -hmm. and because of those, we were able to um, be selected among the group of people that were honored um, as independents that were active in the in in school activities in college activities, and we were in the. Um, a pledge class of Tomahawk, which is an association that, that honors those people in our sophomore, second semester of our sophomore year. And so that's where we met. I don't remember seeing him until we were really on the second floor of... Uh, the Attica Carry Hall? Yeah, Attica Carry Hall. Yeah. The first weekend after we were selected. That's where we, we were given our, our blank pledge board paddles and said, yeah. this is what you got to do. Mm -hmm. But I noticed her pretty quickly. Yeah. And that was the first weekend, so. Yeah. And so that's that's where we met. And uh, Jerry was elected president of the of the class. And um, I guess afterwards he told me that he decided that that because he was president of the class, he wasn't going to date anybody in in the class during the class period. And. It's my story. I'm sticking. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But later on, before the end, before the semester, before the end of the semester, we were dating. Yeah. That's a good story. Um, I'd like to move on to talk a to talk about your both of your experiences at NASA. Um, and the first question, um, Jerry, um, uh, could you talk a little bit about what it was like for you? And I know you've probably been asked this a million times, but what it was like for you to become an astronaut. Um, and what was the path that you took that allowed you to become the first person to be launched into space seven times and only one of three at NASA astronauts to support the U.S. space shuttle program from, its, from before its beginning to its final flight? Okay. Well, I was uh, on active duty in the Air Force when NASA first announced the selection for a new, core of, a new class of astronauts that was hired in 1977-1978. Uh, there were around 8,000 people that applied. They interviewed 210, and they picked 35. I was excited when I was one of the 210 they brought to Houston for that week-long series of interviews and physicals, but I was very disappointed when I wasn't one of the 35 they selected. Uh, after that happened, uh, I did some deep thinking and praying and trying to figure out what to do, coming so close to my ultimate goal and not accomplishing it. And finally, I called uh, Mr. George Abbey, who was the head of the selection board, and uh, I told him I'm trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my career, and um, could I hope for a possible another interview, or was that it? Had they seen something that they just wouldn't consider me for again? Fortunately, uh, he said, uh, no, we didn't see anything we didn't like, and in fact, we hope that you'll try again. And in fact, if you're interested, we would like for you to come down here to Houston and to work as an Air Force officer helping to integrate military payloads into the space shuttle from an operational perspective. And he said, by the way, I'm not making any promises, but it would give you a chance to understand what we do and how we do it better, and we'd get a chance to know you better. So I decided basically immediately that that's what I was going to do. I had to give that another shot, even though I didn't want to leave my exciting work doing B-1 flight testing. Uh, and in fact, I never knew if I was going to get to fly on a military aircraft again by making the decision that I did. But it took me about a year to, for the Air Force to reassign me to NASA at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. And I went down there and worked for a year, year and a half, working on the integration of military payloads and they subsequently had another selection, and out of about 6,000 people, they interviewed 120 and picked 19. And I was one, fortunate enough to be one of the 19 there. And from then on, I mean, that was, that was a yahoo. That was a very high moment in my life to have had the chance to be selected as an astronaut. And from then on, everything I did was uh, trying to learn my, my craft as best as I could and doing whatever was expected of me and more and to uh, try to understand the shuttle systems as best I could so that I could be as safe as I could, not only for myself and my family, but for my crewmates whenever I did get a chance to go fly. Uh, eventually, I did get a chance to fly my first flight about five years after I was selected, and it was more than I could have ever hoped for, and I had hoped for a lot. It was, it was an incredible experience. Uh, it was a, a mountaintop high kind of thing. And, and I knew that I wanted to continue to fly. Um, two flights after my first flight was when the Challenger accident happened. 
Uh, we had to talk as a family about whether or not I should continue because I had family responsibilities. Uh, we prayed about it, and then we finally decided that I basically would be in some ways letting down my friends who had lost their lives in a Challenger accident if I were to leave. Many astronauts did leave, quite a few in hell, not a whole lot, but quite a few. Um, and a lot of astronauts would leave after one or two or maybe three flights, maybe because they wanted to go back to the academic world or they wanted to go make money in the business world, or sometimes their families and or spouses said, it's time to go. Mm -hmm. Thought they had opportunities that they wanted to pursue. They had other opportunities they wanted to pursue. Some of them went back to the military hoping to become general officers and things like mm -hmm. that. But I knew that I was doing exactly what I wanted, wanted to do, to do. <laughs> and what I thought I had been meant to do. Mm -hmm. And so as long as uh, they would allow me to continue to fly, that's what I wanted to do. And I turned down multiple requests to take on uh, uh, management, managerial type positions because I would rather fly than be a manager any old day. And so that's primarily the reason that I uh, continued to stay in the program, and that was a result of that was I was the first person to fly seven times in space. Uh, I think I did the job well. I dedicated myself to what I was doing. If they told me to go do something, even if it wasn't a flight assignment, mm -hmm. I tried to do it to the mm -hmm. best of my ability and to help my friends go fly and fly safely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the kind of team approach you need to do when you're doing something that is so cutting edge and so much pushing the frontiers and the boundaries of, of what human beings can do. And that's what made it so neat for me to be able to work with a, a team of people with multiple talents and all of them dedicated and excited about what we were doing. And that was, that, that made each day going to work exciting. And it never felt like work to me. And so what else could you ask for? You get a chance to go fly in space once in a while and see God's creation from such an incredible view, vantage point and at the same time enjoy what you're doing each and every day. Mm -hmm. I think two of the keys were that he did do anything that they asked him to do. You know, if he was assigned to do something, he, he you know, put all of his effort into it to try to do the best, best he possibly could. And the next all, he did perform well on flights. Uh, he wouldn't say it, but he did a good job on the flights. So when they were looking for somebody to do a job that they needed to be, have done well, you know, then he got another flight assignment. So, mm -hmm. so he, it, it was due to a lot of effort on his part. But it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> they had to. <laughs> now, was there another part of the question that I missed? <laughs> well, that, um, yeah, I think that's uh, maybe um, if you, that one, that first photograph. This one? There, yeah. I mean, could you give some examples of some of the things that, you know, were the most satisfying for you um, to work on? And sure. Um, when I, when you complete your first year of training as an astronaut, you're called an astronaut candidate during that period. Once you satisfactorily complete that first year, then you become an astronaut, but you're still not flying or assigned to a flight. Uh, so the initial job that I was given after I completed my first year of training was to work in the area of spacewalks or EVAs, extravehicular activity. And my primary areas of responsibility were to work on the design of tools and equipment that the spacewalkers would use outside for a variety of different uh, purposes, to repair satellites, to repair the space shuttle, to provide for better translation aids, in other words, ways the crew members could move themselves around the space shuttle or structures that we might be building in space. Uh, did some work on the development of the man maneuvering unit, which is a little rocket backpack that we could fly, working on tools that we could use for repairing the Hubble Space Telescope and other satellites on orbit. So you were designing and working with I was, I was working with the engineers. Uh, we would say, this is something we need. How can we do this? And I would sit down with the engineers, and they would sketch up something, and I'd say, well, but that's, that, that part's okay, but you need to give me a better handle so I can hold on to it. Where's the tether point going to be so I don't lose the tool in, into zero gravity? Mm -hmm. All those types of things. And then I would get a chance to take the prototype tool into a water tank, wearing a spacesuit, and go test out the tool and see if it was working or not. And we would tweak it until we got to the point where we thought it was okay. Then we would go build the flight hardware, and I would take the flight tools and I'd take them down to the Cape and fit check them on the space shuttles to make sure that they were going to fit properly. I think it really helped too that he had a mechanical engineering background because he could relate to the engineers more specifically, you know, what it needed to be changed or not just feedback from an astronaut's point of view, but also as an, as an engineer. Yeah. So we got to develop all the procedures, all the techniques, all the tools that were used for basically 
all of the flights that were conducted by the space shuttle over the 30-year existence of the program. Pretty cool. And to have your fingerprints all over that stuff and see either you using the tools yourself or see some of your friends out there using those tools mm -hmm. to repair the Hubble Space Telescope and other things is, is pretty neat. We, we could be home watching NASA TV and somebody would be in space and Jerry would say, I helped design that pool tool. I helped design that tool. Yeah. Or, or they'd, they'd have a crew on orbit and they're uh, asking the mission control a question. Mm -hmm. And so I grab the phone, call Mission Control, and say, it's in locker so-and-so uh -huh. or something uh -huh. like that. That was, really, that was really a lot of fun. That was interesting. <laughs> it's Jerry. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> right, right. Or, or we'd, and we'd also see the person in Mission Control picking up the phone and know that Jerry was in the other room talking to the person on TV in Mission Control. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. And they were all our friends. The people that were Capcoms were our friends. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, explain what a Capcom is? The CAPCOM goes back to the earlier days of mission control, and it was a shorthand term for capsule communicator. And even though we weren't flying capsules anymore, the terminology mm -hmm. stayed with us uh, through the shuttle program, and it's still used for the International Space Station as well. So that person is in mission control, and the primary communicator? Right. They're, the, they're the single point of contact. It would be confusing for a crew if they had lots of people trying to talk to them, so that was the one person that would talk to the yeah. crew. For all the earlier programs and almost all the way through the conclusion of the space shuttle program, it was solely staffed by astronauts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we have we started running out of astronauts to do all that role and to do all the other things we were mm -hmm. doing. So we started mm -hmm. using some engineers to support that as well. Mm -hmm. And many of the, the capsule communicators for the International Space Station now are engineers as opposed to astronauts because we're manning it 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. seven days a week, 365 days a year. Frequently, the flight director that was pretty in control of mission control would be right at the shoulder of the CAPCOM, and he would get his team to decide what they wanted to tell the, the crew, and then he would tell that to the CAPCOM, and he would discuss it, and then the CAPCOM would relate it to the crew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, our, our, our consoles were right next to each other, CAPCOM and the flight director, mm -hmm. and he didn't have to reiterate it to the CAPCOM most of the time. Normally, mm -hmm. normally he'd just nod mm -hmm. and say, right. go ahead and, and tell the crew that. Mm -hmm. so. And you've had that. I've done that several. for several different mm -hmm. missions, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a neat role. In fact, when I was <clears throat> a young person, even when I was here at Purdue and uh, when we were watching uh, the Apollo missions, um, I could sit there at the TV and sit in front of the TV and watch it and think, that would be a really neat thing to do. <laughs> be there in mission control and working mm -hmm. on those consoles and talking to the crew and all that stuff. And I'll never forget, on my, one of my very first flights where I was a capsule communicator, uh, at one of the times when we had a lull in the activity, uh, I just kind of pushed back from my console and looked around the room and stuff, and I said, you know, I was right. This is really neat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's where it was. Yeah. So in the early TV coverage, especially of Apollo 11, with you know, sometimes long periods of nothing but silence because they really did, didn't have a lot to say while they were watching the work in mission control. And Jerry would always be right there watching, you know, just in case there was something to see or something to hear. He just, he just loved that. He really, really enjoyed that. So it was almost surreal when he got to be a capsule communicator. Yeah. Um, Karen, I wanted to ask you what it was like to be an astronaut's wife and how you prepared you and your family for the times that Jerry would be in space, and maybe you could talk initially before you were employed by NASA, and then after. Be okay. nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we knew, I knew obviously from the time I met Jerry how much he enjoyed space, so he was working toward it, uh, working toward being in the space program possibly, and he you know, was in the Air Force, and so the kids from the time they were little, they knew that you know, dad was in the Air Force, and then we were out at Edwards, and they knew they flew on the B-1. And uh, so they knew that he flew in high-performance aircraft, so it was kind of natural to them. And they knew how much he wanted to be uh, at NASA. So when we moved, you know, that, they knew that they were trying, he was trying to get closer to the space program. And they also knew when he interviewed and knew when he was um, not selected the first time. And they were so excited. They were old enough that they were so excited when he was, was selected. Uh, that was in 1979. So Amy was um, eight and Scott was seven that, that spring when he was selected. In 1980. 1980, yep. right. Yep. Uh, and um, so they were... You know they were they were always really excited. So we didn't have to prepare them for that because they kind of grown up with the idea. Mm -hmm. And then it was five years, five long years that he was working at uh, NASA, 
as, as an astronaut, astronaut before he flew the first time, so they knew that he was working toward it and excited when he got his first flight assignment. So there wasn't a lot of preparation that I really had to do. And they were, I think, a freshman in high school and an eighth grader maybe when he flew the first time. So they were old enough that they kind of knew what was going on. Didn't have to prepare them a lot. It would have been nice if we'd been able to go down to Florida and see a launch uh, ahead of time, but we, we didn't, weren't able to do that. And we are a young family and uh, living in uh, Houston and going to school and just didn't, didn't do that. So we went down, and I think Amy, I didn't realize the difference between the two of them, but Amy was really excited about it, and she was excited when they launched. And I turned around, and Scott, Scott was crying. And it's only been since we've really, later is, later in our family, last maybe year or two, when we've been talking about it, that Scott uh, said that he wasn't really prepared for it. And so he asked me how I prepared them for it. I thought they, would pre they were prepared for it, but I guess Scott was the one that felt like he really didn't know what to expect, but I had not anticipated that. And um, so we involved the family and everything. We did things together as a family, looked forward to the flight as a family, uh, put our, uh, our guest list together as a family, you know, traveled down there, made plans. So everybody was, everybody was involved. Uh, Jerry, um, the first time he flew was before the Challenger accident. And at that time, uh, taking the wives down was kind of considered something NASA had to do, I think, more or less. So the, NASA flew the wives down, but even the children were the responsibility of the family. So I had to arrange for a neighbor to take our children to the airport, get them on the airplane, and they flew down to Orlando by themselves, and Jerry's parents had to le leave uh, Indiana early enough that they were able to be at the Orlando airport to, to meet the children, um, pick them up, possibly take them to Disney World the next day before they came on to, on to KSC. And it was only after the Challenger accident happened, which was two flights after Jerry's first flight, that NASA really took a second look at it. And there was a big difference between the first flight and the flights after that because they knew that they really need to take care of the families. Um, when we went down for the first flight, everyone made their own arrangements, so we were scattered all over Cape Canaveral and, and uh, Cocoa Beach in different hotels, so it made it very difficult after the Challenger accident happened to go back to all those hotels and pick up all the families and get them together and protect them from the press and get them back to Houston. And so they came, the NASA worked very hard to come up with a, what they called a, a family support plan. And uh, after that, they made reservations for us all to stay together. Mm -hmm. So if so, we could be be away from the press only, and we could volunteer to be interviewed. But we but we could not not be around the press if we didn't want to be. And it made it much easier for the um, NASA to be able to um, keep take us together to um, visit the astronauts take us together for the beach house, take us together when we went to see the launch, and then be together and, you know, travel home together and, um, you know, really to stand as a, a, not a barrier, but, you know, as a support around, around the families. When we were talking earlier today, you mentioned something about how um, you were nervous initially uh, mm -hmm. during the launch, the first uh, six minutes or seven uh -huh. minutes. And, uh -huh. And can you talk a little bit about right. that and how that changed? Right. Um, when you see here 10, 9, 8, 7, you know it's going to happen. You know, up until then there was really no reason to be that terribly nervous because it might happen or it might not happen. But once you're up on the top of the Launch Control Center and hear that last countdown, you know, here, here it's going to go. And I think every family um, heart went into their throat about that time. It was interesting because all of the all the families before launch would be in the launch control center's office, and we'd all get up, you know, during the nine minute hold and go up to the roof, and everybody be gregarious and talking and everything. But as they really came into that last minute, know it might happen, you could just notice that all the families, the individual families, would kind of huddle together because they knew that this was a moment, you know, a moment when something might happen. Uh, then they would launch, and you see the shuttle slowly. It seemed like it very slowly at first would lift off of the off of the pad until it cleared the pad, and then it would just seem to take off. And we'd watch it, and 
for Jerry's first launch, almost as soon as it cleared the pad and we can no longer see it, as long as, as soon as that dot disappeared into the, into the night sky, we were taken, turned around and taken back down the launch control center director's office. But then after that, we all made a point to ask them if we could stay until eight and a half, about eight and a half minutes after launch when the main engines cut off because we knew that up until that point they had a lot of power, a lot was going on with the shuttle, a lot could go wrong and we wanted to stay until we knew that they were safely in orbit and that was a difference between the, between the two times. Mm -hmm. What about after you became a contractor? How did things change? Um, after I became a contractor I had something a little more to think about instead of being so nervous because we were so busy during that time and I was a little bit more part of the part of the program so I knew more about what Jerry was doing. I understood a few more of the NASA acronyms. Um, knew when they went down to do their uh, practice launches. Uh, worked with some of the people that were involved in putting all of the equipment together and getting it shipped down there to support their TCDT and some of their early checks on the suits and um, uh, some things like that and, and then I worked in the, interestingly enough, I got to work in the uh, Johnson Space Center um, crew quarantine facility uh, called Crew Quarters and even when Jerry was uh, going to getting ready to fly, I would work, work some meals and then come back as a spouse at another meal. So on the very same day, I might work breakfast and lunch, and then so I still I was still <laughs> eating home cooked meals. <laughs> and then and, and then come back and, and do that. So uh, it was interesting and it was fun. And when a, when the time um, I sat down at a Sunday meal, I had worked during the weekend, and I sat down at the meal and all of the silverware was in the wrong place. The, you know, the, the, this table wasn't set correctly. And, the, and the, then I looked and the glass was on the wrong side and the napkin was on the wrong side. And, and I was, how could this possibly happen? And I turned around and all the people I worked with were smiling at me because they, they'd done it on purpose because they knew that, knew that I'd be <laughs> notice. <laughs> and so uh, we did that and, um, uh, then it was interesting to be part of you know part of the part of the team and but also too when I was working full-time we would launch and people think about the family staying down at Florida and some of the some of the movies even depict them you know being anxious at KSC watching for their family member to return and that's not the way it is at all usually it was either right after the launch or maybe maybe possibly even the morning after after launch the families are taken right back to right back to Houston and we go about our normal lives during during that time and many times after Jerry's first launch when I was working for the contractor I would come back after lunch and be at work the very next day. Be at work and not only have that because we've gone down on L minus three, I would have work that I need to catch up. So I might work late or if Jerry was up over a weekend, I would come in on Saturday and Sunday and maybe do my work at a conference table in the conference room but have NASA select on all the time so I could see what was going on at the, going on at the same time, uh, watch his flight and do my work at the same time. Or it, sometimes he was going on an EVA. If it was lucky enough to be one of those flights when he got to be on the EVA, we would go over to a Mission Control Center and watch the EVAs from the viewing room at the Mission Control Center. If they'd let you have a time off. Right, but <laughs> I knew they'd let me have the time off because they're a space program. <laughs> but, but then I would come back either that right back from watching that and go work through the evening or work through the weekend. Kids had to go back to school um, because we live in a community where they're where lots of people working in the space program, they considered it normal enough so the kids were, you know, right back in school and they didn't consider it an excused absence so the kids could have the, the, the accepted number of t absences but then anything after that they had to, you know, they had, and they, but the teachers were always really good about giving us, uh, giving them their homework and everything ahead of time. But we had to keep up with our normal schedules. It was only really until STS-107 when Columbia had its accident that people began to really seriously think that something could happen, you know, all the time. We always knew it could, but there were backups, redundant systems. Um, there were systems in place that would help if someone had a leak in the in the spacesuit, 
or lots of things that can be done after you get up that explosive time of launch. So launch is always the most dangerous time. And even in 107, Jerry, uh, you know, has you know always reiterated that the damage really was done done during launch. And I can remember working at my desk at United Space Alliance um, at 107. We'd supported the 107 crew in quarant crew quarantine facility, both at um, JSC, and I'd been the person from Houston to be able to go down to KSC and support the crew there. Knew the crew members very well. I can remember Rick, Rich Husbands, <laughs> Rick Husbands, <laughs> Rick Husband coming in with a great big smile into the kitchen and making his smoothies, his nutritional smoothies, three or four times a day. And we always had to keep special things, you know, uh, you know in the kitchen so he could be able to come and make, make his smoothies. And um, you know, just they're just really nice, delightful, delightful people. And just could hardly believe it when we got the news. I was um, at my desk about the third or fourth day of flight, and Jerry called, and he said that, They'd seen some kind of a problem, but they'd convinced themselves that there wasn't a problem. And then I was at home getting ready to go into a quarantine facility to support the nutritional studies after the flight on a Saturday morning when our daughter Amy, I heard the front door open, my daughter Amy came up the stairs, I turned around to see her face, and I knew what had happened. And that was how we got the news that, uh, that 107 crew had not made it down so safely. It's very sad. Um, and Jerry, you, you worked on the investigation for that? Yeah, I, my job at that point in my career was uh, the chief of the vehicle integration test team. And as such, one of the jobs I had was to operate the, uh, the crew astronaut quarantine facility at the Kennedy Space Center. So I was down on the runway waiting for the crew to arrive and uh, I was standing right outside the convoy commander's vehicle, which was a, a modified uh, uh, travel home that was uh, used as a command post once the shuttle was on the runway. And uh, the guys inside were monitoring the progress of the reentry, and they rapped on the, the door window and told us to come inside. This is Bob uh, Cabana and myself. Bob was my boss. And we came inside, and they said that they had lost communication with the shuttle. And we didn't get too excited about that because that was possible. And then they said shortly thereafter they lost data. Mm -hmm. And that was followed shortly thereafter by they'd lost tracking of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I knew exactly what had happened. So I, I stepped outside the vehicle, said a brief prayer for the souls of my friends, and then got on the, on the cell phone and called the... Uh, the astronauts who were escorting the families of the crew and told them that we'd lost the vehicle to get the families rounded up into the bus and get them back to crew quarters. And then I called the ladies that work in crew quarters for me and told me told them what had happened to get security there, to turn off the TVs, that we'd be bringing the family members back to a, a conference room facility there. And then I rounded up all the, the the uh, flight crew members, my, some of my support folks, uh, the flight surgeons and nurses that were out there at the end of the runway with me. And we all dashed back to crew quarters and started to make the preparations for returning the, the families back to Houston. And then when the families finally did get back there, I escorted them from the elevator to the conference room and then was there when, uh, when they were told that the, the crew was lost. There was no hope for them. And then, uh, and they knew. I mean, they knew. They knew. Yeah. But uh, because by that time the crew should have been down and they've been down safely. So any any wife sitting there knows until they touch down and they. But stop. until they had the final word that you know, there wasn't any hope. They were all holding out hope against hope. So, uh, then I finished the arrangements to uh, get airplanes uh, lined up and for other people to go down and pick up the family members' luggage from their motel rooms and and bring that all back and and get everything arranged to send the family members back to Houston with uh, their escort uh, astronauts, uh, some medical team people, and some other astronauts who were down in, at the Cape as well. And I was hoping to go back on one of those airplanes as well to be with my family and to be with them during their return. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the, in the role of the Chief of the Vehicle Integration Test Team, I also 
uh, was on a, an early response team, a rapid response team. And I was informed that that had been activated and I needed to get my clothes pulled together and to show up out there mm -hmm. at the, the landing uh, strip to, uh, to board an Air Force airplane and fly up to Shreveport, Louisiana uh, to Barksdale Air Force Base. And at the same time, I called um, our son Scott and, you know, first thing he wanted to do was go up and help with the recovery effort. He wanted to do something. He, you know, just felt so sad and so heartbroken. And I did what you would expect me to do. I got round steak and was going to make Jerry's very favorite meal that night. So when we all got together, you know, it'd be something to do to comfort, comfort him, do, doing, doing yeah. whatever I could. But then we got the call. He called and... Yeah. So... Um, I ended up at Shreveport, Louisiana, stayed there overnight, and the next day I, I had a rental car, so I took a team of engineers and technicians down to Lufkin, Texas. That's where they were forming the, the, the big team of people that was coordinating the recovery of the, of the crew and, and the hardware. And uh, the, the engineers I, and technicians I brought with me were turned over to local uh, folks to go out and sweep the, the school grounds at the local schools to make sure that there were no hazardous devices or explosives or anything like that on any of the school grounds. And uh, then I started trying to figure out how to make sense out of all of this alphabet soup of federal, state, and local agencies and how we were going to pull together a plan and Im implement it to search for and find all of the Columbia debris that had been spread over a good share of Northeast Texas. Uh, and so I spent basically the next three months up there mm -hmm. forming that plan and, and running that, that search effort. And uh, it, was, it was tough. Uh, you know, many times uh, all the personal items, crew or related items were coming directly to me mm -hmm. uh, and then funneled through another route to, to the Kennedy Space Center. And it was hard to see, you know, helmets and flight suits and knee boards mm -hmm. and checklists mm -hmm. and other items that were related to the crew members, my friends. Mm -hmm. At the same time, back at United Space Alliance as a contractor, uh, we were uh, uh, directed to safe all of the documentation, anything that had to do with 107. I mean, it could have something to do with how we made the straws, which had nothing to do with the accident at all, but in that kind of a situation, you know, anything that had to do with 107 need to be kept in case NASA wanted to wanted to look at it, um, you know, for any kind of reason. Yeah. So uh, people had to come in on a Saturday and begin, you know, for at the record center and begin pulling all the documentation, all the test preparation sheets, as we call them, things that are directions to how to process uh, flight crew equipment. And be, I mean, that afternoon they were they were already getting them into boxes and safe places, so they would be able to. You know, to tell NASA that they had been safe and ready to send to NASA upon a moment's notice. And then we all knew at that time we were going to be starting the long process of not only grieving but of, uh, you know, waiting until the space sh shuttle would be able to fly again. It was about two weeks afterwards, it was va Valentine's Day, before I was able to go up for a weekend uh, with uh, Jerry. And bring me some new clothes. Bring him some new clothes. and. <laughs> <laughs> See the, you know, on the, I think they were still in the Civic Center at that time, go up on the second floor and just all kinds of very highly qualified search and rescue organizations and people that were there with, you know, determined to do the job. You could, they just walked around with the, uh, you know, a lot of purpose, you know, a lot of purpose in their steps and mm -hmm. um, getting together and deciding what to do and what next, what what to do next, how to, how to best direct their efforts. I was, I was really afraid when you walk into this busy organization inside the Civic Center and you see all these letters of the alphabet represented by all these organizations, you think it's going to be a, a turf battle and fighting and nobody's mm -hmm. going to get along. And it was totally the opposite. I, was, I could have never been so, so pleased as to see the, the response that we got from everybody and the cooperation that we got. And it was incredible to see the resources that the United States of America can bring to bear almost instantaneously if and when no it's problem. needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, we literally had as many as 4,000 searchers out on the ground doing a grid-by-grid -grid search for the debris for mm -hmm. three months. And I also had a small air force of helicopters and airplanes that were doing searches outside the walking area from the air. 
And we also had a small navy of about 30 boats or so with sonar and things like that, scuba divers that were out looking at the reservoirs and lakes all along the debris path. So it was, it was quite an undertaking. And the outpouring of the uh, community was great too. It was just absolutely wonderful. And everybody had the same impulses or instincts that I had. Um, the people that were there in the Civic Center didn't have to worry about what to eat because people wanted to, you know, make cookies and bring up to the people that were there lots to help. Lots of Blue Bell ice cream, too. <laughs> Blue Bell ice cream. <laughs> lots of pizzas. Pizzas were delivered. People would just order the pizzas and have them sent to the, pe to the rescuers. Yeah. It was just yeah. amazing. And the people, um, not only that, but they, people that had restaurants or, or you know, cooked would open up their facilities to cook food for the rescuers. Um, I think food was delivered to them, to the state police, and uh, people that were looking, looking for the crew members and as well as the debris. One of the most amazing things was we, we knew that the National Guard and the Texas uh, Department, what was it called? The Highway Patrol. Uh, a de a Department of Transportation. Anyhow, we knew they were there to help with the, the, the securing the bodies, the finding the bodies. But after that was done, then they all disappeared. And I knew that it was going to be a challenge to find the right Texas resources. Texas Rangers. Right resources to, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do the ground search. And fortunately, the uh, Texas uh, Forest Department had uh, the connections to the national resources. And they brought in firefighting teams that were, that were incredible. I mean... We went out to a facility, a fairgrounds-like facility, and to look at it on one day, and the next day there were a thousand firefighters there with their camp, their trucks, their radios, all their equipment bedded down and ready to go to work the next day in the mm -hmm. field. And one of the neatest things was I went out to these camps many times at night to thank the workers for what they were doing and telling them how important it was and to encourage them to continue to be very careful and not get hurt, but at the same time do a very diligent search. And I, and I got to see that many of the firefighters were Native Americans. And it was exciting to see how excited they were about the opportunity to be able to contribute to our country's space program mm -hmm. and how excited they were about the space program and how much they wanted to mm -hmm. contribute and see us get back to flying as quickly as mm -hmm. we could. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was really neat byproduct of a very bad situation. And back in Houston, a lot of people that worked at JSC or contractors near JSC wanted to go up and help with the search, but word soon came that they had the departments from the state and the local and the national uh, governments, you know, there on site. So a few people were able to go up, but volunteers were really, really, really discouraged. And we at least tried to funnel them through a system so we could, so we could have some control of not have people just wandering around out in mm -hmm. somebody's mm -hmm. pasture somewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. more question about the space shuttle program and it might be a, a hard one for you do you have a favorite mission that you were on <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm often asked <laughs> if I had a favorite mission and and I've answered that in two ways all of them mm -hmm. uh, or probably the next one <laughs> yeah, or the next one would be another good answer that I haven't used too often <laughs> But probably, I mean, it's, it's like asking a mother, which of your seven kids is your favorite kid? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess if I had to pick one, it would probably be my first one. Mm -hmm. Because I did, it was my first one. Uh, I got to go on two spacewalks. I launched three satellites. Uh, I got to fly with some of my, my friends, classmates from, from the astronaut office, as well as uh, Bruce Shaw, who had been one of my classmates from test pilot school. He was a commander on the crew. Charlie Walker was a payload specialist on that mission, and he was a Purdue graduate. So a lot of pluses for that flight. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was new for the whole family, yeah. new yeah. for him and new for the whole family, yeah. new, new for our extended family that got to come down to got yeah. Kennedy to see the launch. We'd never done it before. But, but each flight was unique and different. Uh, there were no two that were redundant or felt like I'd been there, done that before. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was nice because it really allowed me to enjoy multiple different aspects of the space program. I visited the Russian Mir space station. I helped to start the assembly of the International Space Station and to do a second visit to it after it was manned and was being used for research. And, and so it was, it was a, a broad spectrum of, of the shuttle era and into the International Space Station program and 
quite exciting period of time for us to be involved in it. And it was fun for our families to get to be old hands at going down to KSC. You know, now that you've done it before. Oh, yeah, this is no big deal. Are, no, are, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, no, it's never <laughs> like that. Oh, we get, to, we get to go down again. But, you know, talking about where they stayed the last time and where they think they're going to stay this time or, or visiting. Go, there's a Denny's in, in Cocoa Beach that we like to go to, and we go there for breakfast because you could do breakfast before you went out to KSC to, to do things. Or uh, you know, after Jerry would launch, we might have a group of 24, you know, go back to that, that Denny's. That Denny's has lots of really good memories for us. Karen always had a big party for all of our folks that were coming down for, for the launches, and, and it included people from both of our hometowns and from Purdue and from our various mm -hmm. other segments of life at Wright Pat and at Edwards mm -hmm. and there around our locale and, and uh, Friendswood and and she got to have great parties and I had to talk to people <laughs> on the phone. And so. most most of the wives did. Most of the wives had. We had call them pre-launch reception. So there, one of the things you got to do when your husband was assigned was kind of talk to some of the other people and find out where they'd had their pre-launch receptions and how they'd worked out and how you'd go about making the arrangements and and you know getting getting to do that, but at the same time you know needing to talk to the people and and the, but it was wonderful because. There'd be lots of people there that we hadn't seen in years, but then they'd all, you know, all kind of be there at the reception to get to see so so many people, mm -hmm. and that was, um, you know, she said it was something. some of the best times she'd ever had in her life, and I wasn't there for any of them. Well, but we did get. Um, I don't think we did it for the first one, and uh, we really hadn't thought about it. But um, later on, especially when we went to Patrick Air Force Base or the Officers Club uh, or the and later on in some restaurants, we learned that we could get a, a phone and have a small room with a phone in it and then just direct people into the room to talk to Jerry on the phone. So if he got if to my to sleep people. shift was compatible right. with the party. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. right. So that way he get to participate and people get to talk to him and say hi to him and you know hear his voice and hear how excited he was and ask a question or two. So mm -hmm. that was, we, we figured that out after the first time. Pre-Skype days. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was. Yeah. Pre-cell phone days because you directed them to the room. Right. Yeah. So Jerry's on the Land phone. Line. Jerry's on the phone in that room there, so have to show him how, how to get there. Right. And that brings up something else, too. We, um, In order to see the crew member uh, or ta talk to the crew member, uh, they went through different phases, you know, not being able to speak to the crew member or then later on being able to talk to them with a Maybe video. while we were on orbit. Yes, with a video audio telecon, video audio telecon. And it got to later where Jerry could pick up the phone on the space shuttle and space station. Space station. Space station. Mm -hmm. Space station and call my home. So. She wasn't home. She was e out. Things evolved. Working. No, Working, she was out messing around. <laughs> Someplace, probably, probably at work. So for a long time on our answering machine, uh, we had a call from space. Uh -huh, we had it for a while, <laughs> yes. But it really was a difference just to know in that short period of time, in that period of 15 years, that it changed that much. Yeah. Um, we're almost done. We have one more segment. How do you guys feel? Do you want to take a break? Do you want to? We're doing good. You we're doing good. Okay. I'm doing okay. fine. Okay. We we love this. We. <laughs> 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 um, it's fun to share. It's, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I want to uh, shift to the, the last segment before we look at the objects, um, and which is um, I've been thinking about you know the present now, what you're doing now, and the future. So that's okay. sort of the theme. Um, and the first thing I want to ask you both about really is um, maybe Jerry, you first. Um, what are your hopes for the book, the Spacewalker book that um, Purdue University Press has published, will publish now? Um, and it's it's offshoots the ebook and the the um, app that we talked mm -hmm. about today. Um, so, what are your hopes, both of your hopes for that? Mm -hmm. Well, we're both very pleased with the the way the book has come out. Um, I wrote the book primarily to document what I had done, so that my granddaughters, who were all very young when I completed my astronaut flying career, uh, would know more about what I did. Uh, but I also wrote the book to, so that it was somewhat entertaining mm -hmm. to give some people a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what it's like to be an astronaut and some of the more uh, entertaining stories that I've had uh, through my career. But primarily, uh, one of the major emphasis of, of the book is to talk to young people 
just as I've done, gone out and talked to schools throughout my entire astronaut career and to tell the young people that they are unique and that they have got very special talents. And if they can figure out what those talents are and how they can best apply them in their adult lives and then to set goals for themselves and study hard and work hard. I think that's something that young people need to hear. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that they need to also hear that a, a young boy from northwestern Indiana who grew up in the country, didn't get straight A's in school, uh, got in trouble once in a while on the bus because he was acting up or something, mm -hmm. uh, can dream big. And they can, with hard work and hard study and not giving up too easily, achieve those dreams. And if they achieve those dreams, then they're going to be excited about their lives and what they're able to do and accomplish and see. And I feel extremely blessed to have had that spark when I was a very young child and to have had the, the help of family and friends and, and God to, to achieve those goals and to enjoy a, a blessed career. I really do feel like it with a great family and, and friends and to have now the chance to try to help young people understand that they could do the same thing with their lives and their careers. And so through the book, through the ebooks, through the apps that we're developing, all of those things and the way we're trying to target them with your help and with uh, Charles's help uh, and with uh, some of the education uh, schools uh, folks here that are working on uh, possible ways that we can incorporate it into STEM education. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities. Um, I approached the school about possibly participating with them in ways to get STEM education more widely uh, distributed to young people and encourage them to get involved. Uh, I, I know that the term astronaut immediately gets the attention of young people. Mm -hmm. And if there's some way that we can use that term to at least get the door open a little bit so that they'll peek in and see what might be involved in science, technology, engineering, and math and get them to help, help them understand that it's not things that they have to study, it's things that they should want to study because of the exciting opportunities that can give them as adults and, and give them specific examples all around the state of Indiana of careers that are being uh, pursued by young people, people just like them that aren't that many years out of school that are applying that science and math that they learned in school and show them that they can have career paths right here in the state of Indiana that will utilize those skills if they will endeavor to gain them themselves. And I just hope people enjoy it. Um, the, my life that we've had is nothing that I anticipated. Jerry had that spark from the beginning. He followed his path. You know, he followed what he, so he was hoping for this life, but I had no idea I was going to have this life. You were along for the ride? Uh, no. Uh, I, but, so mine would be the other way. If you know, if you, I was, would encourage people just to enjoy our story because we had had such a wonderful life, a life that, you know, hopefully that we were able to follow God's lead and be able to, enjoy things that we never, that I never dreamed of, that my family, you know, family never dreamed of, and just be able to uh, share it with other, other people a little bit. Um, uh, there are some, we've had some really, really good times. Jerry's had some exciting times, and I hope that, that through his story, they'll be able to enjoy it too. I, I think the book is a very easy read. It's basically almost like it, when you're reading the book that, that I'm sitting down on a, on a sofa and, and talking to you. Mm -hmm. It's a very casual kind of book, and I intended it to be that way. Um, at, at the same time, um, there are some areas that are technical, but I've minimized those, and I've tried to write it in a language that anybody, from, I'd say, from the fourth or fifth grade on up should be able to read the book mm -hmm. and understand it. Mm -hmm and enjoy it. I think it's an enjoyable read, and I mm -hmm. think people will have a lot of fun reading it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that kind of brings me to my next question was, if they want the more technical stuff, they can come to the, to the archives here at Purdue, and you've donated your papers. Right. Um, and I, would, I wondered if you could say a few words about you know, what your hopes are for the, your, your papers that you've donated okay. and their use. So. Well, as the years have gone by, and as I've flown every one of my space shuttle missions, I've collected a series of documents that were associated with each one of those flights. He, he didn't, I'd like to interject, he didn't set out specifically to collect things. It's just that there are things that are so special 
And when you look at them, there are many things we run across. You know, you know, this flew in space, or this is what you did pre prepare for space, and you. It's just something that you can't part with. You don't want to throw it away. So, you know, they brought them right. home and kept them. So when Purdue University announced that they were going to form a National Archive, I went Eureka. Mm -hmm. Because I, I didn't know what to do with all those materials. They, they were very special to me. They had a lot of meaning. They were historic documents. Uh, but I knew that my children weren't going to want to have several file cabinets full of things that dad had kept forever. It'd take a lot of thing, a lot of effort to maintain them. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, but I think that uh, including those here in the archive will be a great resource for people to look back at the shuttle era of the manned spaceflight program and to understand what we did and how we did it and to get some more specific detail of how we documented things in our checklist and how we trained and how many people it took to train us and to prepare the vehicles and, and to do the mission control and the launch control and write everything the, write else. Write the checklist. You know, yeah, I, the it's, I mean, it's just incredible the number of people that dedicated hours and hours of endless toil, even though most of them really enjoyed what they were doing, to get any one mission off the ground and to bring mm -hmm. it home successfully mm -hmm. and safely. Mm -hmm. And, and I can tell you that when children come in to the archives and they see something, a document, a checklist, something they know that an astronaut used, mm -hmm. and they, mm -hmm. they just, you know, mm -hmm. they, they mm -hmm. just get so excited mm -hmm. and turned on mm -hmm. yeah. to learning more. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's wonderful that you've chosen to do this. We're great. very grateful. Yeah. I, I hope that, uh, as you, you were talking, that the archive can find more ways to make these things readily available online and other ways for, for young people and adults alike to... Uh, to experience yeah. mm -hmm. the materials that, that we're putting into your keep. Yeah, wonderful. Um, could you talk a little bit about the Crown Point School that was named I'd love after to. you? <laughs> uh, very pleasant surprise. I received a phone call from one of my high school classmates one day, and um, we talked and had a little bit of a little chatter. I hadn't heard from her in a long time. And uh, she said, uh, by the way, the, the school system up here is getting ready to build a new elementary school. <clears throat> and um, In the country. In, out in the country. <clears throat> it's in the township where my great-great-grandfather first settled in Indiana when he came from Northern Ireland via Philadelphia. And she said uh, this, the school board decided that they would let the parents of the children that would be going to the school <clears throat> helped to select the name of the school. And uh, they've selected your name. <laughs> wow. And I'm, they asked me to call just to find out how you would like to have the name on the school. <laughs> do you want astronaut Jerry Ross? Do you want Jerry L. Ross? Do you want Colonel Ross? Do you, what, how would you like to have it? And I, I was just blown away. I mean, <laughs> I, and, and, uh, and, and the good thing was I didn't have to die first for them to name the school after, which was pretty nice of them. So that was an, an incredible uh, phone call that I received, and I was, I was totally blown away by it. But uh, it was an uh, honest surprise and a very probably maybe the largest honor that's ever been bestowed upon me is to have my hometown yeah. do something like that for me. And, and to have the general public do it as opposed to some school board or something else yeah. deciding it. Or, or enjoy the fact that they enjoyed the connection enough. You know, that they, that they appreciated that he was from their hometown and felt close enough to him to be able to name the school was a really great honor. Well, as I, as I told you earlier, I, I tried to go home after every one of my flights to, to reconnect with, with the hometown and to share with them the incredible experiences of what I had, I had done on that last flight. On my first flight, I went and spoke at every one of the schools and at each of the parochial schools, and I did multiple interviews, radio, TV, and <laughs> print. And, uh, and then I did some things here at Purdue and then some in Indianapolis before I went back home. And literally, they could have poured me onto the airplane. <laughs> I was exhausted, and I couldn't, I couldn't talk anymore. I was hoarse. Uh, so I learned from that, and so for all the other flights, I would do one thing in the hometown in the big high school auditorium on an evening mm -hmm. event where whoever wanted to come in could listen to and me. And that way the, the parents or people that didn't have children in the school system yeah. could come too. Yeah. So. 
So I, I did that every time uh, religiously, uh, and uh, and I enjoyed those uh, exchanges and to be able to share with the community. And had friends and people come from uh, other counties too. Yeah, to yeah, or the even, even other states too. in some cases. So. Mm -hmm. One thing you said, maybe the last time you were here, that I was so amazed at is that you try, you time it, you try to visit your school. So that you get every child gets to right. The Jerry, Jerry Ross Elementary School has, I think, it's fourth, fifth, and sixth grades in it now. Maybe it's third, fourth, and fifth. It's yes, changed. Yes, third, fourth, and fifth. But I, but so, so there's three years, and I try to get there at least at least once every three years, so I can talk person to person with every kid that goes through mm -hmm. my school, mm -hmm. and uh, and the message I pass on to them is exactly the message I'm trying to pass through the book, and I've been doing for. Years and years, I've I've given a talk in every one of the states in the union and, and Washington D.C. and about 17 foreign countries, and in most of those uh, presentations, I've tried to speak to children and to try to pass that message of of hope and challenge that they can go out and do something great with their lives if they'll if they'll take up the challenge. Studying hard and working hard worked so well for him, and he got to do things that he enjoyed so much. He doesn't want somebody else to miss out on that opportunity yeah. to enjoy their life. Yeah, and sometimes the kids, they just need to hear that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they mm -hmm. can be a B student or a B minus. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and work hard. Yeah, I, you know, I, I wasn't blessed with the, a brilliant brain, but I was, I was given a good brain. Right. And if I applied it and I worked hard at it and I studied, then I could, I could get the material, mm -hmm. but, I, but I had to work at it. I wasn't, it wasn't instantaneous kind and of thing. And it doesn't have to be something as big as being an astronaut, no. you know? It doesn't have to be that. No. There were people in the space program that worked in the space program that worked as buyers, you know, in procurement, in public relations, uh, folding the towels, uh, ordering, the, ordering the cosmetics. Um, Technicians makeup. turning wrenches. I mean, a broad Every, spectrum of people. Everything. And we all felt like we had, had really good jobs. We enjoyed being part of the space program. We felt like, you know, we were doing something that satisfied, you know, satisfied us. It was interesting. It was interesting because you could go talk to almost anybody and they would tell you that they <clears throat> had, the, had best the best job. job. Not, not an astronaut mm -hmm. or not the mm -hmm. boss of the program. Mm -hmm. They had the best job. Mm -hmm. And that was very special. You don't see that in very many different places in, in the world. That was everybody. Everybody yeah. loved their job. One of my best stories is I was down at the Cape. I was working in the middle of the night in another building from where the astronaut crew quarters was. And that's where I was staying overnight. And I had completed a test like at 2 o'clock in the morning on some hardware that was getting ready for a launch. And I was walking back uh, uh, into the building where the crew quarters was at. And there was one sole janitor mopping up the floors in the hallway. And uh, I was in my blue astronaut flight suit. And uh, he said hi, and I said, hey, how you doing? We struck up a conversation. And he told me that he was so proud of his job, that he was so excited about what he was doing, and that he had been there in that pro in the, with the program uh, since the Gemini or Apollo days. I don't remember which now. But this was well towards the end of the shuttle program. And, and he loved what he did. And he felt that he was a, a contributing member to the success of the United States Space Program. And I said, you are. He had seen you, a lot more of the program than a lot of the astronauts. A lot of the astronauts, Jake Jerry yeah. said, would fly two to three times. That was their, really their career. Yeah. And he had been able to participate you know, in those early programs all the way through the shuttle program. And he'd been able to see it all, be right there, probably watch a lot of crews walk out of that building. But you could just sense the pride. And what he did, and how he did, and why he did it, and mm -hmm. what better can you say than that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that kind of leads into uh, one of my last questions, and that's about the future of manned space flight. And I know you both feel strongly about that. Mm -hmm. Would you want to say a few words? Um, yeah, I, I'm pretty frustrated with where we are right now with our country's space program. Uh, when uh, the current administration came into power, NASA had a, a mandate to go build rockets and capsules that would send us back to the moon to establish a semi-permanent uh, station on the moon. To learn what we to, needed to, to do. To learn how to use in situ the capabilities or the resources there on the moon to manufacture rocket fuels or to generate oxygen 
uh, from the water or the, the ice on the moon and things like that. Grow, grow the vegetables potentially, up there? Potentially grow food up there, develop the equipment and, and make sure that the equipment is going to operate in, that condition, in those conditions for long periods of time. That would allow us to eventually plan to go on a manned mission to Mars. That's where we were when the current administration came on board. Uh, we, we were building, designing and getting ready to build two new rockets and a new space capsule which would look very much like the Apollo capsule, except larger for a crew of up to six. Called Orion. Called Orion. And we were also in the preliminary stages of starting to look at the design for a new lunar lander which could take as many as four people down to the surface of the moon instead of just two. Um, that was all planned during the Bush administration. And along with that was a plan to retire the space shuttle, as we did. Uh, the problem was, was that the Bush administration and Congress didn't provide enough funds for all of that to go forward at the same time at the pace that everybody wanted it to happen. Mm -hmm. So things were slipping, and when you slip and you already have a fairly large standing Arby that's working on the design of all these things, the costs go up. And instead of giving us a funding curve where you have an initial spike in the funding and then it goes down as you get from the, the design and test into the manufacturing and operations phase, uh, we had more of a flat level of funding which caused us to stretch things out. Uh, the current administration, the Obama administration came in, they said, you're behind, you're running over on cost, we're going to cancel everything. So they killed everything. They killed both rockets, they killed the Orion capsule, they killed the, the lunar lander, they killed uh, our plans for going to the moon and eventually on to Mars. And then after a while, Congress said, well, we're not so fast. And they started giving us some money back to build the Orion capsule, uh, continue on with the development of it. And then uh, we've since got direction to continue to build the supersized rocket, which will be able to put large masses into space. But beyond that, we really still don't have any cohesive plan on what we're going to do and when we're going to do it and why we're going to do it. All of that was basically replaced by we're going to pursue um, cutting edge, cutting edge game, techno game changing, game changing technology technologies. when it comes along. When game, when game changing technology comes along, then we'll apply it to something sometime, somewhere, maybe. Mm. For an organization like ours, which, is, which cuts its teeth on challenges, and trying to push back the frontiers of space exploration to be the rug literally pulled out from underneath us and then told that uh, we might do something someday but don't get too excited about it. Very, very frustrating. Mm -hmm. and, and we have lost a lot of our talent. Uh, the people that were working on the shuttle are for the most part gone uh, and they'll never be recovered. We lost a lot of our engineers and a lot of our, our really good management team because they, they want things to do that are exciting and new and not be sitting there at your desk wondering when something might happen. And so, and we've also are not getting the caliber of new people in as hire, new hires because they want to go places where something exciting is happening. So it's a very frustrating period of time and we'll just have to see how things go from here. Uh, but. It, I would like to personally see the space program and other research and development type of endeavors within the federal government put on to a different level of system. One where they get a certain amount of funding, level funding is fine, but keep it at a certain level, give them a mandate, here's what we want you to do over the next five years, here's a level of funding, you guys plan your, your spending in, uh, as you see fit. But don't have politicians redirecting or re-establishing the criteria or how you're going to do things every time there's a change of administration. You, you need longer planning horizons. You need longer term goals. You need a more consistent level of funding so you're not killing, starting, restarting. D d dependable. Yeah, dependable. So, that, so that you can really do things in a, in a logical, consistent fashion. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the space program is not the only one. There's probably other research and development type of efforts in the, mm -hmm. in the federal government that probably ought to be along those lines. But, mm -hmm. but get it out of the political arena mm -hmm. and get it into a more scientific engineering type of uh, direction and, and oversight. Mm -hmm.
And, and from my standpoint, I was worked for a contractor, and we were talking about what there was going to be the gap, the gap between the space shuttle program, which everyone accepted we would have to have in order to have the funding to be able to start the Constellation program, which included I, Orion and the other vehicles. Um, and people were hoping that that gap would only be from maybe 2011 when the last space shuttle flew until maybe 2015, 2016. And somehow or other, we were going to try to bridge that gap, keep enough people on board, keep jobs for enough people until they started operations of the Constellation program. And uh, many people were going from space um, shuttle jobs or even space station jobs to Constellation jobs with the hope that, that would take them into the future and very talented people. And I can remember the day um, in February when somebody came in, I came in the office, sat down on my desk, and someone came to the door and said, have you heard? And I said, what? I said, they canceled the Constellation program. And all those people that, that had careers in front of them, and especially maybe people um, early career, mid-career that had changed specifically the Constellation program, that was going to be their program, suddenly found that they didn't have a future. So naturally, they immediately had to start to look for jobs other places, just hoping and scrambling for you know anything, in oil and gas, um, um, public relations, you know anything around the Houston area. So it it was a huge effect to the, those people who had made space exploration or space program their their career career goal. In many ways, I think it felt to much of the workforce the same as the two shuttle accidents felt to them. Mm -hmm. It was a real punch in the gut. Mm -hmm. It was that kind of a, a gut feeling that they'd, it really hurt the, the workforce tremendously. Well, they had excitement and um, uh, pride in feeling like they were part of the only large national uh, science program or science project that, that we had. And they'd obviously... Um, decided that that's the, what was going to be their career path. And then suddenly that was like saying, you don't matter. It's not important. We, we don't need to do this anymore. Yeah. And it was a, a real blow to what people believed. You know, it's like, like felt, they didn't feel like supported or validated anymore. Sure. I mean, the, personally, I think, you know, what you're doing, reaching out to, to, to children again and to young people in high school and I mean, those are the leaders of tomorrow, and, and more efforts like that to, to get the public support, you know, and to get them angry. And, yeah. You know, we have to support this, mm -hmm. this kind of research. Yeah. Well, NASA it's had always done things in a step-by-step -step project. They yeah. may not be able to go to, to the moon tomorrow, but they're always taking the next step. The Gemini program was one step. Mm -hmm. You know, going halfway to the moon and then going to the moon and then you know then you know <coughs> orbiting the moon several times and then before they finally landed on the moon they couldn't do it the first place and that was the approach that has worked so what was in the head of us with the constellation program was building the new vehicles you know testing the new vehicles using one of the vehicles to go back and forth to the space station then going to the moon then landing on the moon then building a base on the moon while those game-changing technologies hopefully would come along that would give you the propulsion system and their uh, radiation protection to be able to make the trip to Mars. But now all of that has been truncated and you know, totally stopped. So. Yeah. Pretty frustrating. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't like to end an interview on a negative tone. No. <laughs> so um, I wonder if if we could talk about some of the documents, sure. Jerry, then, and maybe get some of those kids excited and bugging their parents to um, help them continue to do well in school. I think there's one more down there. And maybe perhaps if you could just you know, sure. tell us what that is and uh, uh, describe the document that you've donated. These are from your collection, right. your papers. So, Tracy, you've uh, selected three documents that I've already donated to the archive, uh, which are checklists. Um, the first checklist here is one that was used on the ground by the astronaut support personnel, or, or commonly known as Cape Crusaders. They were crew members that weren't flying on a specific mission, but they were assigned to work at the Kennedy Space Center to prepare the vehicle for launch. And they're called Cape Crusaders because they all lived in Houston. 
but they crusaded back and forth to KSC to work. It's also a play on words with uh, the Cape Crusader. Uh -huh. But, but uh, as the chief of the vehicle integration test team, my people were the ones that prepared this checklist. And they would work with all the different entities that had inputs into the configuration of the cockpit of the crew, of the crew compartment uh, prior to a launch. So all that was carefully documented into the checklist, including the crew preferences for where maybe we would put some Velcro, or where did they want their cue card, or where did they want a stack of tape that was going to be ready for them to peel strips of tape off to tape hardware down once they started to configure the space shuttle from a rocket ship that just ended up in orbit to one of uh, staying on orbit for an extended period of time. Everything was planned. Everything, Everything was planned. Could you show us one of those? Pictures? Sure. I'm going I'm to open it up now, and maybe we can zoom in on this. But what you see here are some of the panels inside the space shuttle compartment, and it depicts each switch, each circuit breaker. It has the name of each of them by the circuit breaker or the switch. And then in a pictorial representation, it showed the astronaut support personnel exactly where that switch should be set for launch. And the same information was put into the launch control documents that were used in the launch control center to call out to the astronaut support personnel who were in the cockpit on the pad exactly where each switch should go. And so my people had to coordinate both documents, make sure they synced up, and then they were there in the mission control center as all these switches were being set and made sure that everything went smoothly and if there were any questions, then we were there to be able to respond to them very quickly to answer any questions that the ground control team or the crew inside the cockpit might have. So you carry that with you? Uh, my guys, and, and I use the same checklist too. When I was the, the chief of the, of the Cape Crusaders, and when I was still mm -hmm. an active astronaut, uh, I, I would go into the cockpit using these checklists and help set up every one of the switches. There's over a thousand switches in the crew compartment, and we had to verify and re-verify the configuration of each and every one of those switches so that they're all set to the proper and correct position before the crew got in and re got ready to launch. The Cape Crusaders also stayed in uh, astronaut crew quarters, so we made meals for them too, and I worked in astronaut crew quarters with a team of people from the uh, Titusville area that, that uh, served meals there. And we'd talk about, you know, where's where's so and so? Oh well, he's gone out to babysit the babysit the orbiter. That's what they call it. They babysit the orbiter because they had to do it day and night to get it set up in time for launch. Or they got, they call it uh, working the switch list. Once the the crew took over the control of the crew compartment, then we didn't let any technicians or anybody else into the crew compartment because once we had established a configuration that we wanted the cockpit set up in for launch. We didn't want anybody else coming in there and changing anything or accidentally bumping a switch to the wrong place that could have been potentially catastrophic. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, once we had completed all of our configuration of the vehicle and every switch was set properly, then we would man the vehicle around the clock until such time as the pad was cleared in preparation for fueling the large external tank. And at that point, then the babysitter would leave the pad mm -hmm. and there was nobody else out there anyhow they would fill the large external tank with over half a million pounds of liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. And then the first people to go back into the cockpit would be the crew member uh, that was going to be the lead crew member for that flight that was going to strap the crew members into their seats in preparation for launch. And it seemed very reasonable and very appropriate that the, people, the last people to be in there and make sure that everything was just right were people that one day would um, know that their lives depended upon other people setting the switches right. Mm -hmm. Then that same uh, astronaut who helped strap the crew in for the launch would also be there with me on the runway after landing and they would be going into the crew compartment to help the crew get out and to extract the equipment and things that we needed to bring back out after landing on the runway mm -hmm. and that we wanted to con maintain control of before we turned the vehicle back over to the the ground processing team at, at the Kennedy Space Center. And there were also people, um, among the people that I worked with, that were part of that closeout crew that were able to strap in the, the astronauts. Mm -hmm. And they took great, great pride in their jobs. They were very skilled people and 
They were among the last ones to go up on the orbiter when the orbiting was beginning to come alive. And yeah. uh, they were good people. The, uh, the other two tech checklists you brought are both from uh, my third space shuttle flight, STS-37. And this first checklist, I really didn't use very much because I wasn't directly involved in the deployment of the Gamma Ray Observatory. Linda Godwin and Jay Apt were the two that used this checklist. Uh, Jay was primarily the one that worked with the Gamma Ray Observatory, and Linda Godwin was primarily the one who operated the robotic arm to, to lift the Gamma Ray Observatory out of the payload bay and prepare it for its solar arrays to be deployed and then that antenna boom to be deployed, which didn't happen. I had to go out on the, the contingency spacewalk to manually release that antenna boom. But uh, again, this is exactly the kind of checklist we, we uh, carried with us. And the first page is all this, the authorizing signatures, and it tells you exactly what version of the checklist, because many times we made changes. And then this told you page by page which version of the checklist was being used on that page and then a table of contents, and the table of contents had the flight rule summary, which was the, the rules of engagement, if you will. These are the things you can and can't do, and if this bad thing happens, then this is what we're going to do, all that type of stuff. It has a section on post insertion operations. In other words, once we got onto orbit and we opened up the payload bay doors of the space shuttle, these are things we did to the Gamma Ray Observatory to make sure that it was... Uh, in the proper configuration and that, uh, and that everything had survived the launch properly. And then periodically, there's one that's called GRO status check. Periodically, our, our timeline checklist would say, Jay has to go do the GRO status check. And it would reference the gamma ray deploy checklist and a page number. And Jay would come to this checklist and run those steps, make sure it was all good. Be sure everything was still all in good shape in the, right. in the payload bay. And then there's another section that's called uh, in-bay checkout. This is, again, as we're getting ready to pick up this, uh, the Gamma Ray Observatory and deploy it into orbit, uh, there was a series of things that we would do uh, to make sure that the satellite was ready to uh, be picked up out of the payload bay. And then there's another one that's called pre-release ops, which is uh, a series of uh, additional checks we did on the satellite. And then uh, the Gamma Ray Observatory Release Ops, another section of procedures that was a coordinated set of procedures uh, with the crew members operating a space shuttle, the crew member that was talking to the satellite through a radio connection, and also keeping in sync with the robotic procedures that Linda Godwin was following in her robotics checklist. And the procedures are step-by-step -step instructions. Step -step Very instructions detailed. Do. Don't leave anything to chance or memory. Do the sequence in step, in each step. Check it off. Make sure you did it right. Read it twice. Get your, get your crewmate to read it with you and verify. Put your finger on the switch. I'm going to throw this switch and I'm going to throw it up or I'm going to push it down. And that's the way we always try to do everything. We always try to double check each other. Don't leave anything to chance. Don't do anything that we could cause a problem or damage some hardware. And the hardware. Capcom might be talking to you at the same time. And then, and then we talk to the ground. We would tell them uh, we, what we were getting ready to do. They'd give us an okay that the ground was configured and ready to follow that procedure. They didn't have any concerns or problems that would maybe delay uh, getting ready to do that part of the checklist. And then- They had, they had lots of backseat drivers. All the time. <laughs> they didn't trust it. No, that's not true. <laughs> and then, in addition, um, at NASA, we're always thinking about what could possibly go wrong. And if it goes wrong, then what do we do? And in this checklist, we had another section, which was contingency operations. And you can see there's a whole series of contingency operations that fills up all the rest of this page and goes over into the next page as well. And then in, in the back of... Uh, of the uh, the checklist are all those different tab sections with all those different procedures, and uh, we use we help the ground teams to develop these. We help to uh, write them in a way that was understandable to us. Mm -hmm. There were certain standards, just like there's style standards for writing a book or something like that. There are certain standards on how you wrote these, but also we would work on the the 
the terminology that identified a switch so that we understood exactly what that switch did and we knew where it was. And, and you had to know what it said because I'm looking over his shoulder and it looks like hieroglyphics. It's a shorthand. It's all shorthand. And it's, but it's something that we understood thoroughly. We understood the schematics, the, the wiring diagrams behind what was going on in a checklist. And uh, we practiced it time and time again in a simulator. Uh, even when uh, the, uh, the training team uh, would throw malfunctions into the simulator to see if we would notice that something was not doing what it was supposed to do and that, uh, and that we could then identify what the problem was and perform the right workaround with the, with the problem that we'd identified. Mm -hmm. And of course, we would talk to the ground and make sure that they agreed that we were, in fact, had documented or had determined what the problem was and that we were going to the right procedure and that they were ready for us to do each of those procedures. And this is part of what they called the flight data file. And there was a whole group of people that were responsible for the flight data file. Yeah, and there was, there was a different person that was the book manager for each one of these checklists. And it was his or her responsibility to make sure everything was done properly, documented. It went through a change control board so that everybody that had any interest at all in each of these books had a chance to review them and to verify that they were happy with any and all changes or any and all inclusions in the book. So mm -hmm. you can see why it took a lot of time and a lot of people to make everything work. Now the last of the, of the checklist you brought, which is falling apart a little bit, mm -hmm. was uh, ascent checklist for STS-37. I flew as a mission specialist number two on STS-37. Uh, in the cockpit uh, on the flight deck, there was a commander who was in the forward left seat. The pilot was in the forward right seat. Right behind the pilot was mission specialist number one. And then behind and between the commander and the pilot was the mission specialist number two seat. And as a mission specialist number two, that role uh, included being uh, like a flight engineer for launch and landing. And in, in that role, you helped the, the commander and the pilot run the checklist for ascent and for entry. Jerry got to do that, and he liked it when he was in this Yeah, that was really cool. <laughs> he liked it, it, and he got a really good view, too. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a great view. You got to be on the flight deck. And it was kind of like being the catcher of a baseball team or the yeah. quarterback of a football yeah. team in some ways because you had the checklist, and you kind of said, okay, we're here. The next step is going to be this. You made sure that the commander and pilot were pushing the right buttons or throwing the right, right switches, and uh, it kept you right in the middle of the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it, and, it, and it was even more challenging during the training than it was during the flight, because during the training is when they were throwing all these malfunctions at you multiple at a time. People running sometimes. the simulators and, would. And, uh, mm -hmm. it, when, it would. When you'd be down there, I mean, those, they had horns. <laughs> the instructors had horns on them because they were, they were mean. <laughs> because they're always coming up with new and better ways to deceive the crew and befuddle them. And they, they think they've seen this before, but they haven't because this is a different way we're going to put the malfunction in. And it's, and it's hiding the really bad malfunction because they can't see it because of what's been missing in their data streams. And They really and, enjoyed that job. They had fun. They would smile. They yeah. thought they had the best job in the yeah. space program. They, they were evil people. <laughs> but basically, this is what the shorthand checklist looked like. For, for ascent wow. on the space shuttle. And, uh, and I would sit there and check things off, and there were, were things what we called abort boundaries, which is shown over on, on this page, that the ground would call to us at certain velocities normally, uh, that we were, uh, had changed our abort options. Uh, early on, we had no abort options, uh, and then as we got a little bit higher in altitude, we had what we called a return to launch side of our aboard, RTLS, which meant that we would loft our trajectory, go more high, higher than what would be normal, and then we would turn the orbiter around and fire the rocket engines in the direction we were currently traveling to change our velocity so we're now headed back towards Florida. And then at a certain point, we would cut off the shuttle's main engines and do a maneuver that got rid of the large brown external tank and then we would become the glider and, and fly back mm -hmm. in for a landing back at the Kennedy Space Center. RTLS stands for Return to, to Launch, launch site. site. And then as you got uh, higher and faster, you couldn't do that anymore. You didn't have enough capability to go back to the Cape. So you had other downrange abort capabilities 
depending upon the orbital inclination of your orbit, if you were flying in a high enough inclination, and in other words, a large enough angle with respect to the Earth's equator, more north-south in your orbit, then we had downrange abort sites along the east coast of the United States. If you were flying in an orbit that was closer to the equator, then our abort sites were across the Atlantic Ocean in, uh, in Africa or in Europe. Mm -hmm. And then the, the final was an abort to orbit, which meant mm -hmm. you didn't have enough velocity to stay in orbit, but you had enough velocity to stay in orbit for a little while and abort once around, maybe. Mm -hmm. start, to, start to landing about halfway around the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. But, and there had to be people at all of these sites ready. ready. And, and so after, after ascent, then, depending upon the velocity and the altitude at which you had managed to cut off and everything, then you would uh, either have to do an Ohms-1 engine firing, which was an orbital maneuvering system engine firing, which was smaller rocket engines that had internal fuel inside the space shuttle, which would give you then a final push to get you into orbit. Or if you are on the proper trajectory, uh, then you only had to fire the rocket engines one more time about halfway around the world from where you launched to put you into a normally about a 160 nautical mile high circular orbit. Mm -hmm. And they really never did do an RTLS, oh, thank goodness. a transatlantic site abort, or, uh, you know. We did one abort to orbit because we shut down one engine early. Mm -hmm. uh, so then if we had had any one of those aborts, then we would have gone to the appropriate tab here in the checklist and done those procedures as was called out for. And if we didn't have to do that, then we would go to the Ohms 2 burn procedures, which circularized our orbit and kept us up in orbit. And then after that, we'd go to the post Ohms 2, which we'd start to turn off some of the systems and prepare to go into on orbit operations. And again, it looks like we're all that shorthand. Yes, oh, yes. It's all Next very much shorthand. I'm going to have to maybe translate that page. <laughs> if I can remember that. <laughs> Write it down. Uh -huh. That's amazing. And, and then further back, there are, uh, are blank forms that if the ground was going to give us a certain procedure to, uh, to, to burn the rocket engines, uh, then they would give us all the information about where to point the orbiter, uh, which engines to use, how long the burn would be, um, what time the burn would start, all those types of parameters would be voiced up to us. We would load them manually into the computers. And, we still have and sections saved go. with a paper clip there. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's kind of it. There are some malfunction procedures back in here to help us uh, deal with those should they occur. We also had a lot of information about the transatlantic abort sites and some of the other abort sites. Uh, we had a certain code we could put into the computer, which would tell the computer, okay, we're not going to orbit, we're now going here. And it would change the software to help us get there. And, uh, and then there's other information we would have about the navigational aids at the, at the landing site, uh, some specifics about the runway, about how long it is, and, and things like that as well. So, Everything planned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, you, and then you had to know all this stuff oh. and be able to respond to it many times in simulations. Fortunately, during launch, they were you just kind of check off the normal things and didn't have to worry about much of the other stuff. So mm -hmm. that was pretty good. Mm -hmm. They had people in place to make all these things work, plan everything, back up everything. And now there are other companies kind of starting out from the beginning to rebuild. From scratch. Thank you for, for talking about the documents. That's very, very special for, for us as archivists, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. um, well, we're almost at the end. Okay. Um, um, I want to ask. There's, there's. I want to ask you if there's anything that we haven't talked about that that you think I should have asked you, or that you'd like to say. Or I think one thing I'd like to add is the um, how I changed or learned to be an astronaut's wife. The first time I was really, really anxious, um, Jerry's first flight was the only, the 23rd space 
uh, shuttle flight. And so the, even though things had gone really, really well up to that point, everybody knew it was very dangerous. And um, so I was, I mean, I was very anxious. Just Jerry's family were, I don't think, I don't think our children were that much. Um, but, you know, Jerry's parents, of course, were really anxious. And I just didn't know if, if things were going to go well, if the, if the launch was going to work, not going to work. Didn't, you know, had never done this before, had never been down there as a wife before. You know, every, everything about it was going to be new. Uh, trying to get the kids down there, everything was, you know, was, was different for us. I was teaching at the time, so we had to, you know, plan for, you know, substitutes and get all those things to work. At the same time, we were dealing with the idea that he was going to launch into space, something that people don't do every day. And I was, you know, really, really nervous. As the closer it got, the more nervous I got. Um, went down to um, KSC, got to see him just briefly at a, at a dinner, and then the next day at the at the um, beach house. But I was very nervous when I woke up and uh, knew that that evening we were going to launch. And everything went beautifully, absolutely, absolutely, really well. And we were so relieved and happy. But then, just two flights later. Uh, some people in the Challenger lost their lives. And by that night, Jerry and I were back at Ellington Air Force Base, and we were watching those wives and those families get off the plane, and, and the children were crying, and the, you know, the, the wives looked brave but just blank. Like, you know, they had, weren't, who can prepare for that? You just, you just can't prepare for it. And you had, know you have to accept it, and you didn't know what was going to happen the next days. And, you know, saw them them deal with that so bravely and over the next month they were really you know courageous and very gracious and and appreciated all of the outpouring of uh, sympathy from around the world and after that 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 taught me something because I n knew from that point on that I couldn't go back and enjoy Jerry's first flight I had been nervous and I couldn't couldn't go back and enjoy it I enjoyed what I had been able to enjoy but I couldn't do it so from the, that flight on I tried to very consciously um, enjoy everything that led up to it. It was a very special time. It was a time when Jerry was, Jerry was excited. The family was excited. We could all have a really good time because if anything were to happen, you'd have you know, all of your life after that to, to deal with it, and there'd be a lot of people there for support. So, and I knew that Jerry was doing what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. That made a big difference. Yeah. Wonderful attitude. To... Oh. Yeah. Something he had to learn, and it was a discipline. Yeah. Yeah. It, was a, it was a discipline. I did, I did let myself, I talked before about the nine minute hold. We were always sat down in the launch control center watching the pad and, and you knew that things could change and they could not launch. You know, at three hours um, there could be a leak, two hours afterwards, one hour the, you know, the winds could be bad, you know, you never knew. But when we got out of the, out of the nine minute hold, they took us down long stairways and, and up um, wire, um, metal ladders, you know, up to the roof and everything. And knew that when we started that, I did let myself feel feel panic, so my life was kind of punctuated That's by okay. those. I did too. <laughs> I know, <laughs> punctuated by those, punctuated by those. You know, mm. those times when hey, this is stressful. This is serious. No more time to enjoy yourself. This is a time when we just have to, you know, hold together and mm -hmm. and pray and you know hope hope mm -hmm. that everything's going to be okay. And everybody had done. And I also took really comfort in the fact that I knew that there are lots of talented professional people out there that cared so much that done everything they can to make sure it's safe. Yeah. Wonderful. Anything else? It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't you. change anything. Thank you both so mm -hmm. much for sharing all of this with us and with Welcome. the community. Thank, Thank you. you for asking.